So the first panel that we're going to be focusing on today uh, will look at the global scenario and our different speakers uh, will bring their own experiences on how the issue is being dealt with and what the challenges are. So let me welcome uh, those speakers for panel number one. And let me just remind you, obviously, there will be a Q&A session after each panel, so you'll get a chance to ask whatever question you want. So let me welcome uh, here Joseph Nan O'Reilly, Head of Education Policy and Advocacy at Save the Children, Emma Gromley, Education Advisor for the UK Department for International Development, Tejendra Perali from UCL, and Fadi Halisu from the Malala Fund. Please welcome. So I'm starting with Joseph. Um, obviously, at Save the Children, I mean, we saw some of the issues there, and one of the main drives of Save the Children is to make sure that children across the world can avail themselves to what is a right of education. We also know that that's not happening in many parts of the world, or not as it should be. Sometimes it's financial issues. We also see extreme cases of governments that are using it almost as a political tool. So I guess my first question to you is, what do you think the challenges are right now the main ones facing refugee and immigrant children when it comes to their right to education? So <clears throat> I think um, one of the most significant challenges is the number of people who are on the move. So we are all challenged by uh, the largest uh, displacement on record since the Second World War. So that's the phenomenon with which we're dealing. The vast majority of our work over the last few years has focused on refugee education rather than migration for other reasons per se. And I think although this report does a terrific job of outlining both of those things, it's important to distinguish both um, the differences in respect of both drivers of uh, movement as well as the experiences of people. Um, obviously, when someone moves as a refugee, they're seeking uh, protection, and then they arrive in a country uh, seeking asylum, uh, and um, the challenge for them there is uh, the retention of their rights, including the right to go to school. The single biggest thing, I think, is that the vast majority of refugees in the world end up seeking protection in low- and middle-income countries whose education systems are often already struggling. Um, of course, then there's the question about the environment, the policy and operating environment in which they find themselves. But even in the most positive uh, and progressive environments, such as Uganda, where refugees have the right to uh, enter uh, education, um, the country is massively challenged because the places in which refugees um, are settling are places where less than a quarter of children complete primary school, Ugandan children. So the system is already stretched. Um, there's a whole other question about whether or not they're learning. So you've got a great policy environment, but not enough provision, not high quality enough provision, and certainly insufficient support from the international community. The final thing I'd say is that this report and the work we're doing focuses on the challenge of including refugee children in the national system. Historically, um, refugee education, education for displaced populations has been in parallel to or completely separate from the national system. And that's posed significant challenges in respect of the accreditation of children's learning and the creation of learning pathways. I spent three years recently with Save the Children in Thailand, and obviously um, we're supporting education in the Thai uh, Burma refugee camps, which have been around for 30 years, an entirely parallel system where um, generations of children have gone to secondary schools in that system. But unfortunately, no one recognises their qualifications, neither in Myanmar or in Thailand. And so you have this um, uh, great attempt at providing kids with the opportunity to go to school, but even if they graduate, they don't have much to do with it. So the focus on inclusion is great, but we need to provide refugee hosting countries that have inclusive policies with the support and the assistance to make sure that children get to go to school. They get to go to school in an inclusive environment where there's no distinction, as the report um, made clear, between refugees and the host community. But in the process, everyone gets a good quality education. And just, just a very quick uh, question, just following on to that. I mean, obviously, there's not little we can do when it comes to the displacement, but you know, that's, that's another issue. But considering that we have seen such an increase in displacement, do you think that that has been matched by an increased attention, if we want to call it that way, by the international community to the issue of education? There's certainly lots of attention on the question of displacement per se, and unfortunately it's not all positive, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a big challenge. Um, the thing was, in the face of, frankly, the European um, uh, migration crisis, in 2016 at the United Nations General Assembly, the world agreed a new declaration, the New York Declaration on Migrants and Refugees. And it was really saying, look, the current system's not necessarily working for either population, we need to do better. 
And in that, we and others really made the case that amongst all of the things that you could um, safeguard and provide, education has to be key. And we were delighted that um, the New York Declaration makes a commitment to ensure that refugee children have access to quality education in the country to which they flee within three months of arriving. So we have good quality um, uh, commitments and pledges and promises from the international community. We now just have to move to action. And there's a whole process of uh, agreeing what that action will be, the development of a global compact on refugees, which flows from the New York Declaration, as well as uh, a, a program of action, which is about you know, how we deliver on that commitment. So there's a lot going on, and what we're doing with others, UNHCR, is really saying how can we move from that commitment to practical action which safeguards children's rights and their right to education in particular. We've got lots of ideas on that um, and work that we've been doing, but we really need to see a massive scaling up of support for host communities to include children in their education systems. Joseph, thank you. Um, Emma Gremley, over to you from uh, DFID. Now, DFID actually released a new education policy, I think it was February, called Get Children Learning also to provide support for a lot of governments to try to integrate refugees. So I guess, how is it going and how is it different to previous strategies? Um, thanks. I mean, how it's going, it's probably a bit early to say, but it's not a huge departure from, <coughs> from earlier strategies. As the title suggests, the focus is on getting children learning. And we have three clear priorities um, within the policy. The first one is on teaching and learning and really focusing on teachers and recognising the you know, key part that they play in an education system and trying to tackle some of the harder issues around the education system, teachers' unions um, and the broader supportive functions that, that teachers play uh, to improve learning in the classrooms. The second is around system reform um, and trying to look at the educa education system holistically rather than picking at different parts of the system um, and trying to see improvements uh, in the whole. Um, and that's based very much on a lot of the research that we've been doing through the RISE education programme um, and other pieces of research. And the third key area is supporting the most marginalised children. So those would be um, often girls, children with disabilities, uh, but largely also children in emergencies and crises. Um, so looking at that particular group. Um, we support very much the work of ECW, um, and we were one of the founding uh, donors to that, and in fact the largest donors to the Education Cannot Wait Fund. Um, and, and we're actually also just launching a very large multi-year research program into education <coughs> and emergencies as well. But all of this is underpinned by a strong focus on data and evidence, hence our support for, for this report, um, and UIS and the monitoring of SDG4, um, and also by, by research, which is really the backbone of the work that DIFID is doing. Okay, thank you. And to Jendra Ferrari from University College London, um, what would you say are the concerns for higher education for refugees who are actually living in protracted crisis? Because we've seen in this report, you know, <laughs> displacement can mean a lot of things. But for those particular ones, what would you say? Yeah, um, so the, the majority of refugees um, are actually hosted by uh, the, the countries who are in the neighbourhood of the countries who are affected by crisis. Um, and uh, increasingly, um, uh, the countries who have had a high level of uh, you know, higher education participation are entering the scene of the source of refugees. So in recent years, we've seen a, an exponential growth in demand of higher education, um, despite the fact that about 26%, uh, about 36% young people uh, on average go to universities worldwide. Uh, among refugee populations, it's, about, it's just about 1%. Um, before the crisis began, in Syria, uh, on average, there were about 20% uh, Syrian young people who were going to universities. Uh, by 2016, it came down to just about uh, 5%. Um, the, the second issue is really that um, uh, the refugee crisis is becoming protracted over a period of time. Um, so uh, people who have gone to um, uh, you know, high schools uh, in, in those countries because the crisis has become as long as about 25%, uh, 25 years, um, that uh, they are beginning to go into higher education. So there is sort of increased demand from that point of view as well. But also the fact that uh, refugees are willing to 
um, sort of get into the job market which requires a high level of higher education qualifications and it is a motivation for them to kind of exit from the sort of uh, stagnation, whether it is social, or political, or, or, or um, you know, geographical sort of uh, lock-up. So there's that motivation. So finally, I think it is this idea of uh, mobility which inspires young people to seek opportunities in, in higher education because all other opportunities are kind of blocked. So refugee young people see higher education as a sort of means to achieve that social and spatial mobility. Okay. Tejendra, thank you. And now Fadi Heliso from the Malala Fund, so welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about the role of foundations like the Malala Fund, for example, to deliver education to the most vulnerable refugee children? Because I guess the case of Malala Yousafzai reminds us that there can be all sorts of different types of obstacles to children, and in this case, girls specifically, to achieving an education. So tell us a little bit about the role of uh, foundations such as yours. I am not from the Madala Fund per se. Oh. I am uh, running, I found actually, I'm a Syrian, and I founded an organization in Lebanon that works with refugees. So a few years ago, I was chosen by Madala Fund as one of their champions, education champions. And this is uh, an innovative way in which Madala Fund is trying to innovate, uh, to identify education activists around the world in areas of uh, highly importance and priority for them, such as Brazil, Nigeria, Afghanistan, and uh, countries around Syria, India. So what we are trying to do together uh, is trying to push uh, both on the delivery of services. Some of us, like my organization, is working in Lebanon and Turkey on delivery of primary education, where the gap is huge. Others are, uh, including also our organization, are pushing in advocacy and policy change with, with government, policy makers, and donors. And here there is uh, huge uh, uh, efforts to be made around the world on uh, the side of policy making. Uh, we saw how the report highlighted a few of the issues. Uh, it starts with funding uh, to accreditation of the education that is being made. We deliver education for, we were delivering education for the last five years uh, for Syrian uh, kids in uh, schools that are not recognized by any system. Uh, they don't get any certificate, they don't have any future after finishing this education, which is very sad. Uh, it creates kind of new power structures for the future of Syria and the po future of the region where people, even if they got educated, they have no place in the system to advance in their careers. So I think there is here huge uh, place for more advocacy and pushing. If the gov local governments aren't able for some reason to accredit this education, at least we need now uh, a global system that accredits uh, refugees' education and acknowledge the effort they are making. Um, we are working in one of the toughest environments in Lebanon, for instance, which is Shatila Camp. And we are wit witnessing the uh, effects of bad policies and uh, this neglect of refugees for decades re is reflected on the Palestinians themselves, where, where they have even if they go to college or university, they are not acknowledged in the labor market. They have no future in front of them. The only thing they can do is to dream to immigrate to somewhere else where they can work, where they can continue their education. We don't want to see this being repeated, for instance, in Syria on this large scale. Uh, one of the issues, I think, also uh, is to acknowledge the big gap in the delivery, uh, the numbers of students. Uh, that are not receiving any kind of education, neither formal or informal. Uh, other uh, things for policy work is also the, that most of the donors and the international community focus for now is on delivering primary education, and not much is uh, being done for secondary education. Malala Fund is pushing for secondary education, especially for uh, girls, but I think we need to acknowledge that for in case of displacement and refugees, Secondary education and higher education are for, of high importance uh, and uh, they need to attract some much more uh, attention from the donors community and those uh, international organizations working in the domain. And talking about protracted issues, I mean you mentioned some of the Palestinian refugees of course there for generations. We're also seeing the Syrian war obviously now uh, lasting at the 
seven, nearly eight years. And you've also mentioned that sometimes, yes, you can get an education, but your options will still be limited by the outside reality. So in light of that, are you seeing, though, that parents and the children themselves still see education as a priority? Yes, of course. We are, today we are running two schools, each one like is teaching 700 students. The demand we are having, we have in each of these schools a waiting list of 3,000 uh, students. People are demanding uh, education, they are coming to enlist their children, but the opportunities available are very limited. And uh, are unfortunately, the money, yeah, it is good that the report is highlighting on the funding gap, the money available for education would never be enough uh, to deliver education for the big numbers of refugees or displaced pe people. The, the, this is why I think we really need a global revolution in the way education is delivered. It is uh, sad uh, to see that uh, technology is uh, revolutionizing every aspect of our life. Expect education. We are still counting on the old Victorian style of classroom. Uh, and there will be never enough money to build enough classroom for these uh, refugees and uh, displaced people in, in emergencies. So we need to uh, make a global revolution in terms of delivering education to, to be able to deliver to this big demand. Fadi, thank you. Uh, Joseph, uh, back to you. I mean, obviously the issue of funding keeps on coming up. And as you've said yourself, the issue of immigration in many parts of the world is incredibly contentious, lots of political groups using it to their advantage. So if you had to make a pitch now for extra funding, I mean, what would, your, what would you say to potential donors about the importance, you know, knowing their political reality, how would you try to convince them that actually more funding is needed right across the world to deal with this, to stop it becoming a bigger issue later on? So, the first thing I'd say is I, we absolutely need innovation in how education occurs, and I, and I completely agree. I wouldn't give up quite as quickly as Fadi does in terms of the possibility of mobilising the funding necessary. Um, but that's my job, you know, we just kind of keep at it. Um, I totally agree that, you know, um, the promise is still held out and we haven't quite realised it yet. But our report and the, and the GEM um, uh, affirms these, these figures. We estimated that about $11.9, $12 billion is required from international donors to close the refugee education funding gap. And we crunch the numbers and have all of our working assumptions in our report that we launched on World Refugee Day this year and again have been affirmed in the Global Education Monitoring Report. This year, we spent the same amount of money internationally on staging the World Cup, okay, in Russia. So, you know, when you compare the case and the requirement, $11 billion sounds like a lot of money. Um, we were doing the figures. Um, I won't point to anyone in this room who is part of the process, but we were working out where the zeros were, right? And we, would, we didn't know if we had enough. So I, I get that it's a lot of money, but it's entirely doable, you know? It's entirely doable. The other thing that we do here is compare the amount of money that's spent on military aid um, every day with the amount of money that we'd need for um, education. Um, and um, and it, was, uh, it was one to four. So, you know, like it was the, the, the comparison, I think, um, is worth making with other, with other public goods, as it were. So that's the first thing. The second thing I'd say is the first thing we need to do is listen, as you rightly pointed out, to refugee children and families themselves. They consistently say, and we've done lots of work on this, that this is amongst their top three priorities, if not their top priority. It's also, um, we need to recognise, a driver of displacement. In Uganda uh, last year, um, I was talking to South Sudanese children who'd crossed um, the border from Uganda, and numerous children said, our parents sent us when we could no longer go to school in South Sudan because those schools were under attack. And that was the kind of straw that broke the camel's back and said, we don't have any future here, we need to send our children over to Uganda because we understand and have heard they'll get to go to school. And most of those children went on their own with their parents left back in South Sudan or maybe went um, travelled with a, an older female relative. And so education is right at the top of the, the list. And you know why? It's because um, refugee families themselves know the utility of it, know its importance, both for their children, for their families, for their livelihoods, for the reconstruction of the countries from which they come. Um, and of course, we in this room know of the importance and utility of education more generally um, for economies, for well-being, um, for the democracies in which these people um, live. 
And so I would say that um, even if we are only motivated in the international community by self-interest and hopefully enlightened self-interest, education has to be at the heart of the solution to the displacement yeah. crisis. It's absolutely pivotal. It protects children's rights where they are, they're safer, they're better, they're, 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 they're healthier because of education, and it provides them with the hope of building their futures, either in their new host country, in which we have to recognise the vast majority of them will spend their lives, or of course if they uh, have uh, the advantage of uh, resettlement, or, of course, if they return to the countries, like we're seeing in, 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 in Thailand um, and Myanmar at the moment, from which they fled. They need an education for all of those purposes, and it's in our interests and theirs to make sure that they get it. Uh, Emma, first of all, any comment that you have on anything uh, and everything you've heard. Also, we should say the UK is one of the largest bilateral donors um, on education in the world. So I guess how would you encourage better spending on education by the international community and also ensuring that commitments, which are often made, are met as much as they're made? I mean, it's a good question. Obviously, I agree with everything you said. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and as you said as well, you know, the UK is one of the largest bilateral donors to education. I think the second lar largest to primary education although it doesn't answer your point. Um, you know, we have bilateral programs in, in 23 countries. Um, in seven of those, we're the largest donors. Um, we're a member of the G7 and the P5, and therefore we obviously engage in, in international education as well to support countries where we don't have bilateral programs. But I think in terms of leveraging additional support, you know, we were engaged in discussions on IDA 19, um, trying to ensure attention is focused on human capital and education as a part of that. Um, we work closely with multilateral funds, so GPE, to try and improve their work on teaching, um, on ECW, to try and encourage their multi-year funding and, and look at the technical aspects of that. Um, and we're also trying to encourage uh, more donors and more suppliers and more NGOs to use performance-based financing to increase the efficiency of the money that we do have. And, and working with the World Bank, we now have 40% of World Bank funds using a, a payment by results model. Um, and I think also through our country-based advisors, they work locally with education partners uh, and donors in country to try and encourage um, additional spend on education in those countries. Um, just thinking about the, the Syrian example, um, I think DFID was the first to come up with multi-year funding once it became clear that the crisis, the crisis was protracted. Um, normally, you, you find that in humanitarian crisis, funding is very short term, which makes it difficult to plan. Um, but we put in a, a multi-year fund which encouraged other donors to follow suit. So I think we're trying to lead by example. We recognise that there aren't sufficient funds. Um, we're, we're preaching a bit to the converted here because we're all educational professionals, so we all believe in this anyway. I think you know we've, we've gone a long way in getting education into humanitarian programming, but I don't think we've gone far enough. I think we still have this problem where we see um, Education in humanitarian situations is still being largely an access problem and in development uh, a quality problem. And we still, you know, we, we hear a lot of um, talk about moving from one stage to the next, but it shouldn't be access to quality. It should be quality education in a humanitarian setting and quality hum education in a development setting. And that is still problematic, so I think we still have more work to do there. Um, but as I say, we, we're continuing at international levels, centrally and at country levels, to try and push this agenda and increase the education spend. I mean, again, very briefly, if you can, but how much resistance are you meeting? You keep on saying you're trying to encourage all these changes. Are you finding more or less resistance as some of the protracted issues continue? I think less. I mean, there, there's been some good uh, indications recently from other donors. So the EU have made a commitment to put 10% of their humanitarian funding towards education, which is which is great um, and far in excess of, of other donors. Um, you know, the World Bank's recent launch of the Human Capital Index will hopefully act as a catalyst um, to get countries themselves to focus more domestic funding on education, and not just countries in crisis, but, but countries generally around the world to meet their SDG4 objectives. Um, 
we're looking at, as well as other donors, at alternative financing mechanisms, and hopefully some of those will, will come to bear fruit and increase the level of financing available. So I think we are moving in a positive direction. Um, we're constantly competing with funds for other sectors and, and other needs which are which are very strong. If you look at somewhere like Yemen, there is nowhere near enough support for education. At the same time, you have massive cholera outbreaks and, and you know, um, health problems that also need to be addressed. So it's always competing for space against other needs which are, which are important as well. Emma, thank you. Uh, Tashendra, back to you. I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the models of higher education available uh, sort of that exist in the refugee context. And I'm also thinking of technology. I mean, considering all the changes that we're seeing in general when it comes to technology and AI, is that having an impact at all when it comes yeah, to access? Just, um, just before we go into that question, I just wanted to comment on a few things that, uh, that we're discussing now. Um, I think um, the lack of funding is certainly one of the biggest challenges in addressing the, the problems, uh, certainly the educational crisis. But also I think we need to start focusing on how the available funding uh, that has been provided is being utilised. Um, and I think just the money solves the problem attitude is not going to take us very far because these crises and conflicts will will emerge in different places. Uh, for example, the Rohingya crisis clearly uh, needed more support and we're beginning to see some of the funding commitment available in Lebanon uh, for the Syrian crisis just kind of uh, declining in, in recent, um, uh, recent months or recent, uh, you know, year, this year uh, particularly. So, um, and yet, I mean, there are also issues around certification and yet, you know, 50% of um, Syrian children are out of school in Lebanon despite so much of effort uh, actually going on, um, and, and children are experiencing a whole range of uh, challenges, whether it is about a medium of instruction, or whether it is about traveling to schools, uh, and bullying, and, and a whole range of other, other problems. So we need to be thinking about some sustainable approaches uh, which could address the problem of protractedness of the nature of this, this, this crisis. Um, so that's one. The, the second thing is about, I think, um, and, and I think, Joseph, you're absolutely right, that parents immensely value education. I think they see that education is the only thing they've got under control in these crisis settings through which they envision their future. Um, and it's the only way of thinking about future and, and also you know, imagining this unknowable future. You know, wh what is their future going to be? Are they going to be relocated? Are they going to be possibly um, sort of reintegrated? Uh, you know, going back to their own country? You know, all of these are quite sort of precarious circumstances. So that's why they see education as a sort of vehicle for getting out of these, uh, these troubles. Um, so the other thing is, um, I think uh, a lot of t teachers have been displaced, uh, you know, in these these crises. We don't talk very much about teachers, which is really sad. I think, so of course, children are important, but we also need to be talking about teachers. Um, so I was talking to a teacher last week in in Lebanon who was uh, displaced from Syria, um, and his school was bombed three times, and. Um, he, he fled to, to Lebanon and, and living uh, in Beka, and then he's actually running a small school, like the school that you are actually describing, an informal um, educational setting where the, the, you know, there are lots of uh, kids going to this school, and, but they don't know whether their learning is going to be certified, and there are lots of um, <coughs> sort of resentment from the mainstream schools in, in Lebanon. So those kind of issues uh, also need to be um, sort of addressed as well as the, the funding issues. So with regards to your question about what kind of models exist in higher education, I think we're beginning to see uh, different types of approaches and collaborative models in higher education. So one of the, uh, the approaches is really that uh, international universities uh, are um, setting up their academic programs in refugee camps and the, the communities uh, in, in uh, displaced, uh, you know, forced displaced contexts. Uh, where um, you know they just kind of distant teach. They go out there for a bit of period of time, um, and then the rest of the learning ha happens through online uh, sort of uh, medium. The second model appears to be more sort of a scholarship model, where like the DAFI in you know the German scholarship program in collaboration with UNHCR um, sort of provides scholarships for um, uh, university students uh, to go to uh, universities in host countries. 
So third model is really the scholarship programs, right? So I think uh, the uh, sustainable development goal also makes reference to that, uh, which is available for a very small minority of uh, quite successful, elitist, well-networked um, refugee individuals to pursue their master's and, and doctoral programs in developed um, countries. Uh, but the other type of model em is emerging through technology is um, uh, this online education. So the students don't have to go um, away for, for to, to, to gain their, uh, their education. Um, so, um, you know, they can actually participate in, uh, you know, teaching and learning. Some form of certification might be achieved. There are some examples of uh, qualifications being achieved through uh, online learning as well. Uh, but but uh, th there are issues of connectivity, for example. I think if you go to, uh, you know, Tripoli and Bekaa Valley where refugees are living in, um, you know, the internet connectivity is quite, quite weak. Um, so there are those sorts of challenges as well, and the language of instruction is also another another challenge so for many many refugees. So you don't see it having a major impact anytime soon, really. I think this is a, a very recent phenomenon. I think it has escalated certainly in higher education because of the Syrian crisis, that there is a, a sort of um, uh, enthusiasm among the. Uh, you know, development partners and organizations that uh, because we can't fix the big political complexities, maybe we could use technology in order to address <laughs> this, this crisis. And whenever there is money available in order to initiate these kinds of programs, so, you know, naturally you begin to see programs emerging out of that. But also what it really does, it, it sometimes may give a false impression that the online platforms are addressing the educational crisis. So we don't really need to worry about it. It basically siphons off the, uh, the demand of higher education for you know, universities in, in host countries. So I think we need to be so, sort of careful uh, about that. But one thing it does is it probably uh, helps to mitigate these um, chauvinistic sentiments in these countries where there's a feeling that refugees are taking away our university places. So if you are provide, you know, maximizing opportunities through online education, then it might do good for, to appease that kind of sentiment. But it, you know, we, we need to see a lot of evidence in order to establish whether you know, digital education is really addressing the problem. Um, Fadia, final comment to you before I will then open to questions, any questions you have for the panelists and also for okay. uh, Sebastian. So I guess, Fadi, you know, a comment from you on everything you've heard and also before you mentioned that for families, for the children, education is obviously still a priority. I'm just wondering what challenges uh, you face in your day-to-day -day work with your fund when it comes to dealing with state actors. In the region, I think one of the major problems is that the state are dealing with education as a sovereign issue that no one else has the right to interfere in. On one hand, they might have uh, right because a lot of the states th there are afraid that education might be used by extremist movement to pass their ideology to the children. So they won't want uh, total control over the curricula. But on the other hand, they are not being realistic in, uh, in acknowledging the huge gap between the in available infrastructure the state has and the capacities and available fund and the huge need. Lebanon is a very obvious example where despite the huge money that DFID and among other actors has put uh, and given to the Lebanese state, there are still 250,000 students who have no access to any kind of education. And the attitude of the Lebanese government is not helping much in not allowing any NGOs or the civil society much space to help in filling this gap and acknowledging what they are doing by giving certificates. I think here we need to have a much more cooperative attitude. I'm happy that Turkey is doing great steps at, and to include all children in their uh, system for, uh, in 2020, but until then, be, uh, uh, Generations of children will be without any access for education. And the Turkish language will be a big obstacle, even in 2020, for m most of these children who won't be using the Turkish language beyond the school. So this is a big uh, 
a big obstacle to tackle with the state in how to deal with the civil society in addressing the gaps. The second, I think, is uh, ha has been already mentioned, is that uh, refugees are almost everywhere being dealt with as commodities, that we don't take their opinions because they just have to obey what the state decree, especially if they are hosts, uh, if they are hosted by uh, the state. So they are not t taken into consideration in whatever plan, in whatever decisions are made. And this is really uh, sad because people can, they can help. They have a lot of qualifications. They can organize themselves on local level and help uh, bridging these gaps. Uh, and it is being done already on the field. You, you've seen, I'm sure any one of us who went and visited refugee camps, he would have seen uh, local initiatives organized by the refugees themselves, by the parents to teach their children using whatever qualified uh, people they find in the camps or in the neighborhood to start such schools. So it is a shame not to putting all of this together and uh, investing more in delivering uh, uh, education to more and more people with the scarce resources we have. Uh, of course, there will be always money available for World Cups and for bombing <laughs> Syria and Yemen and Afghanistan, but there won't be enough m money for uh, education. So with this little that we have, we need to be more effective and uh, in terms of cost, in terms of how we use uh, these things. Uh, in terms of technology, I've seen in the last five years all sorts of uh, NGO experiments by NGOs, universities, private sector, companies from all over the world figuring out this is the right chance for them to uh, have their own revolutions in terms of apps. Uh, they were experimenting with mobile phones, uh, iPads, uh, whatever, but until very little was being done with the refugees themselves to see how they, can, how they can use this technology that is already available to them and how uh, we can put it in the best service. Until now, I don't think there is a huge progress. And as you mentioned, whatever solutions are presented now for higher education or secondary education are just available for the privileged few who, are, who have their connection, who have already the language skills. I'm here and one of my colleagues here are on the Chevening Scholarship. And the, although uh, the FCO and the Foreign Office have expanded the number of Syrians uh, who are getting these scholarships every year, it's still a very elitist thing to uh, the best uh, uh, of the best of the Syrians who have already achieved a lot in their professional lives. Other people are in much need of these opportunities and this kind of money to go beyond in their higher education and secondary education. Adi, thank you very much. Thank you. We've um, got about 10 minutes now for a question to the panelists. Also, uh, Sebastian is happy to take questions on the report. And Sebastian may also ask you if you have any uh, comments on the things that you've heard. So one question over there, please, sir. Hi. Um, thank you to all of you. That was really great. My name is Haroe. Um, I'm an education emergencies program specialist with Plan International. Um, I have a question. This, this question kind of goes out to all of you, really, so I, because a lot of you have touched upon this idea of including refugees into the national education system. Um, that's something that all of you have mentioned. And this is also something that I have seen. I think I see the benefits of it hugely. Um, so yes, um, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Absolutely, I understand the accreditation issues and the certification issues, I understand. Um, the fact that these are protracted crises and we, you know, we need to in integrate them and so on. But my, I guess what, I'm, what I need help with in terms of understanding is two aspects of this. One is, do you still think there is a, there's space for education for repatriation? Um, say, I'm th so I'm thinking about Malawi, for example, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, with a million or so refugees from Mozambique flooded this incredibly poor country. There was no way they could have absorbed a million people in such short notice into their education system. But actually, the fact that they were using the Mozambican education curriculum by Mozambican teachers, and later on when these refugees were repatriated into Mozambique, the fact that the government accepted these accreditations meant that, I mean, it's hard to use the word successful in any of these programs, but it is one of the more successful ones that we have. 
how do, do you still think there's space for these sorts of things? So not necessarily just including them, but also seeing if there is an opportunity for principled, um, a system that respects humanitarian principles, can, can we use sending country education systems for repatriation? Um, on the flip side is sometimes national curriculums can also be difficult. Um, say, think North Sudan, I'm an Ethiopian, so refugees from Ethiopian, uh, Eritrea, early 1990s, really struggled with the Sudanese re curriculum. It wasn't that the government didn't want to, it's just that it was Arabic, Islamic. Sir, forgive so. me, if you could just then condense the two questions <laughs> right now. Sorry. So, A, can we use education for repatriation? Is that okay? Secondly, what happens when the national curriculum itself is problematic? Okay, thank you. Anyone on the panel who'd like to take it? Yeah. I can do that. Okay. Oh, yeah, quickly. Yeah. Well, I no, mean, it doesn't have to be just, just one person. Yeah. Yeah. You can also um, so I think uh, the assumption that uh, refugees, uh, you know, after a period of time, go back to the country of origin uh, is, I think, is uh, a bit problematic because their futures uh, are, as I said, I mean, unknown, and and lots of things can happen for them, and. Uh, uh, you know that might not be the the, the the only way to think about. And the second thing is that, um, and again, the issue of sustainability. Who is going to provide funding? And I think UNHCR um, sort of has a position that uh, the refugees are provided with the education of the host country. And precisely because of this sustainability issue, where national existing educational structures are supported, if the refugee population are integrated in those structures, mm -hmm. then it might address the problem of uh, um, sort of s sustainability. Um, and the other point there that you were uh, suggesting is that. Uh, Education, e even though um, the uh, host government may not be able to uh, uh, provide uh, education for this massive number of uh, children who are coming to their systems, but they are capable of preventing anyone else from providing education to those children because education is basically a process of uh, creating a national identity and you know it's a public service so every government of whatever level of capacity feels very possessive about the educational process within their territory so we might be thinking as outsiders that why not we fix the problem this way but there are you know a number of nationalistic agenda which need to be dealt with in order to be able to um, sort of uh, do that. So I think negotiation is, is, is very important. Okay. Thank you. Just very quickly. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the, the, the move to inclusion is obviously informed by our evidence of pr protracted crises, right? And so it's this kind of, um, sort of attempt at a practical solution. But I think what your question goes to, which is a much bigger issue than the kind of more practical things we've been talking about today, is the nature of the nation state and education, right? And transnational education. And the idea is whether or not, picking up your points, the kind of nationalistic state is the best provider and all of the things that go with that. It's probably well beyond the remit of this conversation today, but I think in some ways those issues are there. And even this report touched on that <coughs> in respect of the nature of the education that's provided by, by whichever state in respect of you know, its obligations to uh, approach questions of multiculturalism and, um, and, and diversity in a sensitive way. <coughs> So I think in the meantime, though, given what we know about protraction, protracted crises, um, the imperative of providing education which is kind of known, accredited, understood, sustainable, and can be funded via the nation state seems to suggest that more inclusive models um, are probably the, the first preference. Mm. And and just, and so just before, if anyone else has any, another question, please raise your hand so we'll make sure that we get a mic to you, Emma. Uh, ju just a quick comment on that. I mean, I think this idea that, for example, in Turkey, um, Syrian refugees are, are in the Turkish system is a bit of a misnomer, actually, because um, for one thing, 60% of Syrian refugees in Turkey are not in school at all. Um, but the ones that are, are not just straight into the Turkish system. So there are support, there is support available. So there are Arabic language teachers from Syria with those children. There are specific Turkish language uh, teachers there as well. In Lebanon, there's an attempt to 
uh, use more of English language rather than French language because that will be more appropriate alongside Arabic with the Syrian refugees. Um, but language issues are huge when it comes to this, particularly for the lower age group where we know that <coughs> learning to read um, and becoming literate should be in mother tongue. And if you look at somewhere like um, northern Uganda, which, which had the big influx of southern Sudanese refugees, suddenly you were looking at classrooms where the majority of speakers were not um, speaking any Ugandan language, but were speaking um, uh, South Sudanese languages. In which case, which language do you pick? Because you know the country's national language will not be the majority language spoken in the classroom. And in that case, they went for English because it was a neutral language. But there are all sorts of issues that this brings up to do with language, curriculum, certification, and then the bottom line is the average length of, of time someone's going to be a refugee, I think, is, is 20 years or so. So you have to take in all those considerations. Paddy, do you want to add anything to this? Or? Yeah, I think also one of the aspects that are neglected in terms of the national curriculum is that uh, the children refugee are not learning anything about their home country. They are expected and pushed to go back to their original countries, but they are not allowed to learn anything about their history, their heritage, so, and sometimes their own language, and which is really problematic. It, it creates this uh, internal uh, uh, confusion, who I am, who, uh, am I uh, Turkish, Lebanese, Syrian? If I am Syrian, what, what do I know about Syria? Nothing. Okay. Sobering. Um, any, yeah? Um, okay, I'll just say my quick question and then I can pass <laughs> it on to you guys. Um, mine's just a quick question to Sebastian. My name's Julia, I'm Wet for Humanity and Inclusion. And I just wanted to ask um, about the wider issue. Thanks to Emma for highlighting the issue about marginalised children, which I hadn't heard mentioned <laughs> outside of that. And um, children with disabilities and other children can be disproportionately affected by emergencies, as we know, especially in conflict situations. So I just wondered, um, you know, in the spirit of you know working on inclusive education broadly in the in the term that is being used, I wondered if the let's say the wider sense of inclusion was brought up in this report, um, and has that been mentioned at all? Forgive me, just before you start, um, just so we can try and get more questions in, shall we listen to a few more, and then maybe other panelists can kind of pick the one they might want to answer, so we can hear both of them. So, please. Hi, uh, Ruth Naylor from Education Development Trust. We've heard a huge amount about refugees, and it's really exciting, things like the New York Declaration, but what about the internally displaced populations? Um, there are at least twice as many, probably more. Um, what political pressure is being put on national governments to deliver um, to deliver education for IDPs, and, and what, what support is being given? Okay. And if you could then pass the mic, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Jess from Save the Children. Um, so my question is related to teachers. So I was reading this week that in the UK, um, the rate of teachers leaving the profession is the same as the rate of recruitment. And I think in many, many of the responses that are around the world where we work, we see that teacher, retention of teachers is it's very, very hard, um, considering the conditions that the teachers are are expected to working and um, unless well my my question is around the way that teachers are supported in emergency contexts, but also around the issue of incentives which time and time again brings up so much resentment between host populations and displaced populations and I feel like unless there is that is acknowledged we will continue to see uh, low teacher retention and also that has a huge impact on quality so um, it'd be interesting to hear okay. if there's any discussions around changing uh, the terminology and, and also the way that we treat teachers in these contexts. All right, so let's start addressing those questions. Sebastian, you want to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, um, on the first point on you know, wider issues of inclusion and, and marginalised groups, um, actually the next uh, Global Education Monitoring Report is on inclusion and disability. Um, so that'll um, be taken in, in far more depth. Um, this report um, has multiple versions. Um, in March, um, March 8th, we'll release the gender version of the report. So all of these issues will be taken in greater depth, specifically through the, the lens of gender. So you'll have that. Um, on the issues of uh, IDPs, I uh, completely agree. Um, there's a lack of focus on internally displaced people. Um, and there's yeah, possibly twice as many internally displaced people um, as there are refugees. Um, I think you know, one of the reasons for this lack of focus is um, you know, they haven't crossed the border, so there's lots of mechanisms that aren't activated, um, and there's, there's very little research to draw on. Um, I th that's something you know, and, and something we found in the report, so we haven't been able to draw out as many of those issues as, as we would have hoped. And it's going to be a, you know, an increasing factor. Um, we point to that in, in the issue of climate change. 
know, not many people point to the, the, the role climate change is having in food insecurity and in catalyzing the conflict in Syria in displacement in, in Venezuela at the moment. Um, so yes, definitely need more focus on, on IDPs as a sector going forward. Um, and yeah, just returning to one of these points on inclusion and uh, curricula that we were discussing, I think in inclusion goes both ways. It's not including, it's not just including people into a national system, it's adapting the system, the national system, so it's inclusive of everyone and relevant to everyone. It's not just assimilating people, it's about adapting and making it um, totally inclusive and relevant to everyone. Whether it's refugees with multiple possible futures and they, they don't know where their future is going to be, it needs to be relevant for them all. Um, yeah, teachers, um, you know, as the animation said, teachers aren't superheroes, but in a sense, um, we're treating them as if, as if they are. Um, and in, in too many cases, um, refugees are not allowed to work as teachers, or if they are encouraged to work as teachers, they're not paid. Um, so, yeah, definitely, you know, teachers need all the support they can get in all of these scenarios. You know, basic um, things that, you know, being paid, then they need, you know, they need professional training and ongoing professional support. Definitely. Other panelists? I think the problem of teachers is uh, never going to be solved. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> because, especially in the settings of uh, refugees, because uh, the problem that we are facing ourselves is that uh, as much as we invest in teachers, as, mu as fast as we lose them, and we lose them to, to you, to international NGOs who, who hire them as experts in something because they got a lot of trainings. So we lose them faster than we recruit them. Because teachers worldwide are less paid than any other uh, occupation. So once they gain experience and expertise, they would leave just for the sake of having a better income. And this is very, very normal. So it won't be solved in this way unless we have a huge amount of money to pay them uh, the same as we pay to any expert in any NGO and I, or I NGO, which won't happen anytime soon, I think. Yeah, um, uh, I think uh, <laughs> that's an important point, but I think a lot of interesting uh, work is uh, also happening in improving teachers' uh, confidence and uh, uh, professional capacities to provide education in, in context of mass displacement where, where uh, I'm familiar with. Um, and in, in Lebanon, again, to, to give an example, uh, a lot of non-governmental organizations, and some of them actually run by um, Syrian uh, people uh, uh, have recruited, um, uh, you know, Syrian teachers themselves in order to provide education. Lots of international uh, organizations have supported uh, teacher education programs within those those um, sort of institutions where uh, children um, are attending these informal educational settings. Uh, one of the things that we at uh, UCL are trying to do is to design a teacher professional development MOOC, Massive Open Online Course, um, to support um, teachers but who may not have had this uh, teaching qualifications necessarily. Because we're talking about this very uh, fragile and uh, chaotic environment where some form of education is taking place and people are desperately trying to create a sense of normality for, for children and for parents. So they're setting up these institutions within their uh, you know, camps and, and communities. Um, and they are doing fantastic work. You know, they may not have been trained professionally, but they're very motivated because it, it, it matters to them. It's, it's their children that they are educating. So they're desperately looking for opportunities to improve their, uh, their, their practice. And the other thing is that because they've experienced uh, violence, I mean, one of the schools that I was visiting, um, and the head teacher was saying that um, one quarter of the children have lost uh, at least one parent, uh, one of their parents, or somebody in the family to the, to the war, or they've been uh, sort of kidnapped and they, they don't know where they're whereabouts. So there are enormous amount of sensitive issues that teachers need to deal with. So without that sensitivity, which may not be prevalent in the conventional teacher professional development programs or teacher education programs. We're trying to capture those sensitive issues and uh, uh, trying to build uh, conflict sensitivity in teacher professional development MOOC, which we are, we are working on. So that's just an example of uh, 
of an institute, but other people are also working in the area. Um, before I open it to the last two panelists, any other, I think we really only have time for one more question. So, sir, do you want to ask your question now and then the last two panelists? Yes, just, okay. just very quickly, uh, I'm Stepan from the Open Society Foundation's Education Support Program. Um, I was wondering if, sort of in the European context, looking at countries that have received large uh, numbers of refugees, have you come across examples where teachers from the, the sending countries have been um, integrated or have there been sort of efficient pathways of getting them into the teacher prof teaching profession, either as sort of full-scale teachers at some point or rather to a transition phase where they could sort of use their pedagogical skills and, and, uh, and education um, to perhaps help the, the children, the refugee children catch up or fill in the gaps that are not being filled with by the, by the host country. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I caught all mm. of that, but, but I think you were asking about the use of uh, refugees who are teachers in the classrooms to support the refugee children. Yeah? Uh, um, and of that, there are, there are many examples globally. Um, the issue tends to come, and, and there often has to be informal pathways for them to do that. So either as language support uh, teachers or teaching assistants rather than full teachers, and that's often because of uh, local teacher certification rules. In which case, there are examples of, of sort of uh, fast track certification, but probably not enough of those, um, and that's problematic particularly given that there is a shortage in the number of teachers that, that we need to meet the refugee community needs. Um, so that needs to be addressed. I mean, I think the other issue around teachers is that you often have incentive programs for children to attend school, but not for the teachers. Um, and that's problematic as well, because they often are giving up, you know, they have opportunity costs in, in teaching because they're giving up uh, other ways of, of making their livelihoods. And often it falls to the communities themselves to pay um, for that teacher to be employed to teach their children. Um, just quickly to, to come back on the IDP point, uh, obviously this is a massive issue and in some of the biggest conflicts that we have in Yemen and, and Syria at the moment, we have huge amounts of, of IDPs um, and we're probably not doing enough um, to support them and to support IDP children's education and that's an area that we need to address. Um, and on inclusion, um, one of the opportunities that I think comes through um, the refugee crisis and, and through migration in general is this opportunity to focus more on differentiated learning, um, which, which doesn't come through that strongly in the report, but it, it's a mechanism that, that can be used and have seen used effectively, particularly in camps in Jordan um, and also in mainstream classes in, in Jordan, Jordanian schools to support both the, the refugee population but also the host population that were falling behind and giving teachers those techniques to differentiate um, between learners and where they are is really crucial and, and not just looking at, uh, at inclusion as disability, which we often do. Mm -hmm. Joseph, you've got another point or just general closing remarks? Yeah. So, um, I, wanted, I just want to, on the, on the teacher point, obviously, um, yeah, I wanted to pick up this issue of uh, refugee teachers. There's many, many, many um, refugees find themselves having qualified in their um, country of origin, um, not able to use those skills in their new place. Having said that, it's quite difficult for all of the reasons that you were talking about on other fronts in respect of Lebanon to fix that issue. Um, teacher certification, teacher training, um, controls on the number of um, employees in the public service, and then the conditions and, um, uh, under which uh, teachers are often required to work, which often involves um, transferring them around the country, etc. all pose challenges. We certainly were having this conversation in Uganda and provided some support to um, the Ugandan government to have it. But it really relates to my next point, which is, as I, we were, as we've talked about um, at length, the vast majority of refugees in the world, 85% are in low or middle income countries, whose systems are already stretched. And one of the things that we then ask them to do is, yes, to include the refugees, which on the face of it is simple, you know, get them to go to the local school, um, deal done, unlikely. There's lots of other issues. So we ask them to do fast track teacher training for the refugee teachers that have come across the border, amongst, you know, the 101 other things, adapt the curriculum, think about social and emotional well-being, um, maybe deliver early childhood care and education, which wouldn't have otherwise been provided because um, young infants need support or are experiencing toxic stress having fled um, conflict. So there's a huge big shopping list of things that we need to think about to make inclusion right and we're asking stretched systems
systems to do that. And I think that's kind of the, the challenge that we need to, to kind of face up to in terms of how we approach that. The fundamental, of course, is that those countries, particularly that are hosting refugees, are doing so uh, as a global public good. They're doing that for all of us. And um, the New York Declaration speaks about that in terms of responsibility sharing, which is that we all have a responsibility to support refugee hosting countries. And by and large, we aren't doing a good enough job on that per se, um, and certainly not in respect of their obligations in regards to education. So we need to step up. And the final point that I would make is that we've had this discussion and it's, and, and, and it's absolutely the right thing to be, do be doing because population movements are only going to grow. This is not some blip in an otherwise kind of static world where you know, everyone's going to go back home and live happy lives. The reality of climate change and increased conflict and other things, as well as you know, migration for economic um, reasons uh, and, and mobility more generally, is just going to grow. So I think actually the question which we sort of said was a little bit off-piste for this conversation, which is about the relationship between education and uh, globalisation, is the one that's really going to have to be at the heart of this issue, which is what's the sort of education we're providing people in a world which is characterised by, amongst many things, but inherently by mobility, uh, and what's the sort of education that's going to equip us all with the right skills and attributes uh, to live together well and live good lives.